Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 85th episode of The Atlas Society Asks. My name is Jennifer Anju Grossman. My friends call me JAG. I'm the CEO of The Atlas Society. We are the leading nonprofit introducing young people to the ideas of Ayn Rand in fun, creative ways like animated videos and graphic novels. Today, we are joined by an old friend of mine, somebody who uh, rarely grants interviews, and that's Howie Rich. Before I even get into introducing him, I want to remind all of you who are watching us, whether you are with us here on Zoom, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, you can use the chat uh, section to type in your comments, and we will get to as many questions as we can. Now, Howie Rich uh, is, of course, the co-founder of U.S. Term Limits, which supports limits on uh, length of office for officials at the local, state, and federal levels. Um, he is a successful real estate investor who these days and for many, many years has been uh, investing in promoting reform of education, property right protection, and government accountability. Howie, it's great to see you. Good to see you, Jennifer. It's been a while. It has. Too long. So, <clears throat> as mentioned, you've been involved uh, in promoting various areas of public policy oh. reform, but most of uh, your work has been devoted to pushing for term limits for elected officials. Term limits, uh, people may not know, have a history stretching back to ancient Athens and Rome. Uh, the United States, of course, passed the 22nd Amendment to the Constitution back in 1951 to limit the presidency to two terms. So um, for the un uninitiated, what is the political rationale for term limits? Oh, there are a number of them. New faces, new ideas. The longer they're in office, the bigger the spenders they are. There have been studies on that. It's uh, you. What happens over time, mainly to Republicans. See, Democrats when they start out, they like government. Maybe they get a little better at it as time goes on, but it's not much of a change amongst Democrats. Republicans, most of them, but not all, start out being free market, small government types. And over time, they get co-opted. And that is the problem. And they, the re-election rates are enormous. They sort of own their seats. And to me, that's the rationale for term limits. Uh, now, you favor term limits of three House terms and two Senate terms. Is that correct? Yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, in doing a little bit of research, you uh, argued for them in terms of adverse pre-selection. I had to look that one up. Um, so maybe if you could help to explain it to us. Uh, and um, it, is it your contention that the very high re-election rates for incumbents, I think uh, you've cited as high as 95% um, and the seniority system that uh, is, are they discouraging qualified new candidates from running? Adverse pre-selection is an interesting concept. Suppose there's a successful person who thinks, oh, maybe I'll run for the House of Representatives because I want to do something. I want to change something. It could be uh, somebody on the right, somebody on the left. And I, wa I want to, I want to, I want to reform, I want to do something. Maybe I want smaller government, maybe I want lower taxes, maybe I want to you know, cut back on regulations or whatever. The problem is if you don't have term limits and you're a successful person, you say, oh, if I run for office, I have to wait my turn. It's gonna take me 10 years, 20 years, maybe longer. First, I got to get on the subcommittee, then on the committee, and you know I, I'm going to be a junior. <laughs> you know, it's all based on seniority. It's like a labor union, 
And so adverse preselection, the way we see it, is that the best people on average don't run. Why would I run facing this thing? I'm going to be a rookie and some political hack is going to control what I do. But if you had real term limits, the three house terms you mentioned, Jennifer, changes the dynamic completely. Now I'm gonna run and I, I can do what I was elected to do, whatever that is. And then I'm gonna go back to whatever I did before, a doctor, lawyer, you know, you know, entrepreneur or whatever. And so that's the rationale. In other words, we think this, it's almost like the invisible hand. There are people who should be running, who don't run, because it's all based on seniority. All right, well, I've got plenty of other questions, but we are starting to um, get some questions that are filtering in from the audience. So I'm going to turn to a couple of those. Uh, Josiah on Twitter is asking, what is uh, Mr. Rich's view on revolving door politicians who jump from corporate boards to government positions and vice versa? Well, um, I don't see a revolving door. If somebody wants to, somebody is in whatever, government or private industry who wants to run for Congress, that's fine. I mean, we, don't, we don't see anything wrong with that. Um, in fact, probably better off if we had people of that ilk who want to be in Congress for the right reasons. And remember, if they're gonna be in Congress for six years in the House, it, it's, it, it, it's number one and seniority. Seniority system completely goes away. Instead of a, a, um, a, a system which is really based on sort of union rules, you're gonna have a dynamic system. Now we have term limits on 15 state legislatures and they seem to work. We've gotten school choice out of them. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, what they do, for example, one example would be Florida. We, we, we put that on the ballot in 1992 and the voters voted for it. It was a very close election. It was term limits on the Florida legislature, very close, 77 to 23 in favor. <laughs> and uh, what they do there is before the end of one term, they pick the speaker and the leadership for the next term. It's eight is enough. They're out after eight years in the legislature. They go back to doing what they were supposed to do. Okay. So right now the problem is it's not a revolving door. It's more of a one-way door. And, and that's fine. Yeah. All right. We've got um, Jim Turney. He says, great to see my friend Howie again. My question is whether you have seen an un unintended consequence of term limits to strengthen the influence of staff and bureaucrats that become very experienced um, and controlling of the often inexperienced elected leader, uh, what he calls the yes minister effect. Hey, Jim, good to hear you're still around. Well, <laughs> what's the biggest bureaucracy on earth? U.S. government, it's the biggest bureaucracy on, on, on earth. How did it get there? Career politicians, could it be worse? The other thing, the other argument, the staff argument is, oh, staff runs it all. Wait a second, the buck stops here. You're the Congressman, you're the Senator, you can see. <laughs> If something goes wrong, you're gonna blame a staffer. As a matter of fact, when they get elected, they do have they do bring in some senior people, but usually they bring in people who they work with, sometimes even family, to uh, be on that staff. And by the way, in Congress, they have very large staffs, which enable them to get reelected. You know, usually they have two uh, district, two or three district offices. They have an office in D.C. So the, the, the bureaucracy argument is really, in my opinion, very weak as is the staff argument. We hear it all the time from opponents of term limits. But I know, Jim, you're not an opponent. 
All right, we have a kind of a similar related question uh, from Scott Schiff. He is saying uh, he used to be more in favor of term limits, but he is concerned that with our current politics, wouldn't term limits just hasten the far left from taking more power, uh, like if, Sh if Schumer were term limited and opening the door for AOC? Uh, it, term limits, I guess you have to look at what's happened in the states. Uh, when we started out in the term limits movement in the very early 90s, uh, we had a, a strategy to use the ballot initiative process because it's a very simple thing with term limits. Voters love it, politicians hate it on average. And so the states um, that have term limits, it's, it's, it moved for the most part from left to right. It doesn't mean that term limits necessarily moves right, but in, for example, Arkansas in the beginning, no term limits. We came in 1992, got the signatures, put something on the ballot, it won. I think it won 60 to 40 in Arkansas. There's very strong opposition. And it swung the legislature from Democrat to Republican. And that occurred in a whole bunch of states. So I don't think there's any argument one way or the other that an AOC would have more strength or, or, or less strength. On the other hand, if you looked at New York City, which is a pretty liberal bastion where I live, uh, um, the city council in New York City is term limited. That was done in the 90s also. Again, ballot initiative, go to the voters. There I would say you have a point because it's sort of a liberal jurisdiction, it's moved, New York City has moved to the left somewhat. Interesting. Uh, okay, we've got a question from Bruce Majors. Hey, Bruce. Um, he is asking whether you think term limits would open things up for independent or, or third party candidates. Do you think, uh, do you still think this would be a good outcome? Uh, do you think it is much more likely with term limits that we would end up getting, uh, you know, other parties, independent parties involved in the process? I, I don't think it cuts one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And the American political system is winner take all. It's not proportional representation like you have in many countries in Europe, whatever. Um, I don't think it cuts one way or the other with respect to third parties. The problem with third parties in the United States is, again, it's winner take all. And if the sense is that this candidate is a really good candidate, but when I go to pull the lever in the voting booth, if I think he or she can't win, I'm not going to vote for him. And we have a lot of evidence of that. All right, we have uh, Jay LaPere, who's the chairman of the board of the Alpha Society, is in the room and he has uh, two questions. What implications do you see regarding incentives in dealing with special interests uh, if a third of members are not running for re-election? What percentage of the public supports term limits? So. Again, two questions. The, the, what is the popularity right now of term limits? And then also special interests. Uh, what would term limits do to them? take the easy one first, which is polling on term limits. There were two polls this year, two national polls on term limits. One was done by McLaughlin, which just do you favor term limits on Congress? 80 to 10. Then RMG research, 82 to nine. The numbers have always been high, but they're higher than they've ever been. It's extremely popular. And then when pollsters ask strongly or somewhat, strongly always comes up more than twice as high as somewhat. Also voters want shorter term limits when offered the option of 
three house terms versus six house terms, always three house terms wins way over two to one. And anything longer than, than six house terms is like zero. Nobody's interested in that, the favorites term rules. Special interests, I don't, I don't see any uh, advantage uh, that special interests get to the term limit legislature. If anything, term limit legislators would be more independent and far less likely to be influenced by special interests. And as you know now, again, if you look at the system, special issues definitely have a lot of control. Uh, Warren Holly on Zoom is asking, what about term limits for bureaucrats like Fauci um, or at a minimum, no union protection for incompetence? Very interesting question. First of all, I don't think we need it because I think a term limit legislation will handle that much better than the, the uh, career politicians we have today. Um, secondly, we follow, was it Bill Clinton who said, kiss, keep it simple, stupid? And we follow that. I mean, there's so many different variations you can come, with, come up with, uh, term limits on the Supreme Court, term limits on the judiciary. What about banning lobbyists? There's all kinds of uh, variations, but we keep it simple. We favor term limits on the House and Senate, period, end of story. And that is what is extremely popular and that's what we're running with. All right, now you favor uh, a Article Five convention to achieve term limits. Um, tell us what that means and, and why you've proposed it. I think to go there, I think I have to give you a little history. Back in the 90s, we started out on term limits. And by the way, Ed Crane, who ran the Cato Institute, was the one who actually got me and some others involved in term limits. Um, we came up with a strategy at the time because we knew that voters favored term limits, but again, politicians are not excited about it. So, we, in 1992, decided to place initiatives on state ballots in a whole bunch of states to term limit their own delegations to Congress. So for example, I don't know, Missouri, we put an initiative on the ballot in Missouri that if voters voted for it, and they did, to term limit Missouri's two senators and however many representatives, eight or nine, I think it was at the time. And we, in 1992, we did that in 14 states. I think to brag a little bit, it was the most in American history that was ever been done in one uh, election on any one issue. And we were 14 and 0 because voters love term limits and there was strong opposition. For example, in Michigan, not only did we have Debbie Dingell, the wife of uh, John Dingell, if you remember him, but we had General Motors, Ford and Chrysler kicking in money, opposing the term limits initiative, but we won them all. We came back in 1994 and we did nine more. So this story doesn't end well, but it's exciting at the moment until you hear the, the end. Okay, so by that point, 23 states, the voters in 23 states had term limited their own delegations to Congress. And when you think about it, they're gonna be term limited and the other states which don't have the ballot initiative process wouldn't have their legislators term limited. And so they lose out on seniority and yet they all won because voters love term limits. And we follow the adage unsuccessfully, the Supreme Court follows the election returns. And that's why we did 23 states and not two or three states. And we lost the split decision in Arkansas and the Arkansas Supreme Court. We appealed to the United States Supreme Court in the case of US term limits versus Thornton and in a 5-4 decision, we got the four. 
the voters, the, sorry, the justices said, you can't do it that way, need a constitutional amendment. The four conservatives, it was a great, great opinion, minority opinion written by Clarence Thomas that argued 10th Amendment, but we lost. And the decision came out, you needed a constitutional amendment. Well, how do you get a constitutional amendment? The way it's always been done is you need two thirds of both houses of Congress to report out the amendment under Article 5. And then it gets ratified, if it gets ratified, by three quarters of the states. Not an easy process, hasn't been done many times. Uh, but we thought about it and we said, oh, so we're gonna get Congress without enormous pressure to term them themselves? I don't think so. <laughs> so. So the founders in their infinite wisdom came up with a second method. Under Article 5, the Constitution, if two thirds of the states call for a convention limited to the subject of term limits on Congress, it gets ratified the same way. The same way as if it had come out of, um, of Congress itself. And so that's the route we've gone. We've started, only four states have done it so far. Florida, Alabama, Missouri, and just pretty recently West Virginia. We got one legislative house in five states. We think we have a head of steam up. We think we know how to do it. And we're moving forward. So the, the answer to your question is, we love Article 5. Fascinating. OK, we have another question here from uh, Jay LaPere asking if you have any thoughts on the implications of ranked choice voting. I've never been an advocate. Um, I, I don't feel strongly about it, really. It sort of brings it toward the center. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a libertarian and I don't want to move politics toward the center. Uh, so I think that has that, that result, that outcome. So I'm really not a major fan of it. Got it. All right, I want to remind the rest of you who are watching us on Zoom, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, go ahead, tee up those questions. Um, we've got uh, some really great ones and um, we'd love to see what else you've got. And I still have some questions. So um, you and, and your wife, Andrea, late, late wife, Andrea, whom I had the honor of uh, getting to know, um, you both have had a, a long history within the libertarian movement. Um, and Andrea in particular uh, played a role in the founding of the Atlas Society for many, many years. Of course, she was president of Laissez-Faire Books and hosted the Laissez-Faire Supper Club, uh, when, which she invited philosopher David Kelly to address back in 1988. Um, for better or for worse, uh, that speech uh, really exposed the rigidity and, and dogmatism of the orthodox objectivist um, establishment at the time and inspired David to uh, found his own organization, uh, which is of course the one which evolved into the Atlas Society, which I'm privileged to lead today. Now that was obviously quite a long time ago, but um, I'm wondering if you can share any memories of the wonderful community that, um, that you and Andrea created then and perhaps uh, how the libertarian community has evolved since that time? I haven't had much uh, involvement with that because these days I'm really a one trick pony term. Yeah. But I just remember just now as you asked the question, that one of the supper clubs, I don't think it was the one that David was at, one of the supper clubs, uh, I think it was at a Chinese restaurant. This could have been 35 years ago, a long time ago. They had fortune cookies and you know, a little slip that goes in the fortune cookie, we find that fortune. And so whoever did the event put these little slips in the fortune cookies at the supper club. 
And uh, one of the questions was, I don't know why it stuck with me. Um, uh, Who is John Gall? No, that, that was one. But this one was, um, what's a libertarian salad? And the answer in the fortune cookie, let us alone. Ah, uh -huh, I like it. <laughs> Remember like it was today. Okay. That's well, those really were good. the days and it was, uh, you know, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. It's great. And we've got all these organizations now. Atlas has done a great job and, you know, Cato and some of the others. So it's, it's great. But I've really, my focus has been on terminus. And the reason that I really picked terminus, first of all, I think it's an extremely important reform. I think it really can really change things in the United States is that there are so many ideas that probably all of us or most of us could agree on. Like I don't like raising a minimum wage. I mean, you know, we're all gonna agree on all this stuff, but fighting that one, you're knocking your head against the wall. We have one here, I don't know how this happens, that is extremely popular, term limits on Congress. There are all kinds of motivations for that. But it's one that is popular and we think we can get there. Well, so tell us a little bit about uh, US term limits and the work. I know there's a pledge. What, uh, what are the priorities and, and how can people get involved? It's a political, it's a political strategy. <coughs> The market here are state legislators because we have to get convention calls out of state legislatures. So what we do is in campaign season, when they're running in primaries, it could be a Republican primary, it could be a Democratic primary, or in general elections, where there is an election that's at all competitive, we play. We ask all the candidates, we have a team of people who do this, to sign a term limits pledge that they would sponsor and vote for an Article 5 convention call limited to term limits on Congress. And we're pretty successful at that. And in some races, sometimes there are open seat races where there are multiple candidates. That's the other thing that term limits does, it creates far more competition. Um, what we find is one candidate may sign, let's suppose the other candidate doesn't sign. We play. We play, these are usually state legislative districts in small states. We don't play in California, because remember under Article 5, you just need 34 states to move toward a convention. So South Dakota is as good as California for this purpose. And districts in South Dakota are very small and very inexpensive to play in. So what we'll do is direct mail, maybe a half a dozen direct mail pieces, praising the one candidate who signed the terminals pledge and going negative on the candidate or candidates who did not. Um, and we'll also do digital impressions, no TV in these districts, doesn't make any sense, they're small districts. And we have a great track record because it's an extremely popular issue. And in state legislative elections, there's not much going on. And if you introduce this issue of term limits, which everybody favors, it moves the ball. Got it. We got another great question here from Fred Young asking something that was on my mind. How many incumbent congressmen support term limits? Fred, that was a softball question. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a bill in the House of Representatives, HJR 12. And Ralph Norman from South Carolina is the sponsor. There are 77 incumbent congressmen on it. Uh, one Democrat, 76 Republicans. It's for three House, two Senate terms. And the Senate, 
Ted Cruz is the sponsor of the same bill, three House, two Senate terms. There are 16 senators on it, all Republicans. And this grows in every cycle. Um, if it's 77 now, I don't recall the number in the last Congress, but it's probably in the 50s. We think we may get in the House to over 100, slightly over 100 in this cycle. And the way we do that, I don't want to confuse everybody about the pledges, but the state legislative pledge is one thing I mentioned. We have a congressional pledge. And this one says, I pledge to co-sponsor and vote for a term limits amendment for three House and two Senate terms. And then it has these four words and no longer limit. And the reason for that is that it's divide and conquer. I favor three terms and you favor four terms and somebody favors six terms. Maybe somebody favors nine terms. You can never get to two thirds in, in Congress. So we've stuck to this. And of the 77 uh, members, I think 73 of them have signed the US term on this pledge and we hold them to it. There were a couple of congressmen who had signed the pledge six or eight years ago, got on the bill, Republicans, and then were approached and they didn't get on the bill in this last Congress. And so we held their feet to the fire. We put up billboards, we did digital, we even laid in TV, we didn't have to run it because they got on the bill. So it, this is a separate pledge. The idea being in the end game, we believe in the end, it will not be a convention, even though we're moving toward a convention because Congress in the end will preempt. They've always done that. And there's an additional incentive as to why they will preempt. And that is because if there's a convention, the delegates, the different name in the constitution, the delegates, the delegates will be comprised mostly of state legislators. What do state legislators want to do? move up to Congress. So if there's a convention, they're gonna probably not want to grandfather in Congress, they want to make it retroactive or partially retroactive. So Congress in very high probability under pressure will do it. And there is history on this, the 17th amendment for direct election of senators, whatever you think of it, the 17th amendment was extremely popular as its term limits today. Uh, they, they couldn't get it. The House didn't care. The House of Representatives voted two thirds of the House voted five times for direct, for direct election of senators. And the Senate, of course, wouldn't budge. It's not in their interest to do it. And so what the, the, the activists did at the time is they went Article 5. There were 48 states. They needed 32 states. They got to either 31 convention calls or 27, depending on how you count it, four of them were suspect. By that time, two thirds of the Senate voted for direct election. So now you can vote for Chuck Schumer. <laughs> hmm. All right. Well, um, got a bunch of other questions, but I wanted to take a step back for a moment and uh, ask you, you know, as mentioned, many decades working on, on this issue, on other issues, school choice, property rights, uh, the libertarian supper clubs, laissez-faire books. What was it that just kind of kindled your interest in limited government? Was it something that you absorbed from your family? Was it early experiences? Was it a book? The mentor. Uh, it wasn't family. I think my father was um, sort of a moderate Democrat. Democrats were different then. My mother, I think, was apolitical. It wasn't family. I think it was, and I think you might have guessed this, Ayn Rand. We have to hear what? your origin story. <laughs> 
because I read everything, okay? And some of them multiple times. The great difficulty with the speech in Atlas Shrugged, and this was not last week, this is many years ago, but I read it all. <clears throat> I read Fountainhead, We the Living, and all of them. Not the night of January 16th. There you go. Okay. I read them all. It got me involved. That's how I got involved with Cato and on and on in the Libertarian Party for a number of years. And I think Ayn Rand was the source. That, that Do you really remember did. who introduced you to Ayn Rand or how you picked up the book? Wasn't probably assigned reading in school. I've heard stories of people going to a phone booth and it's a little slip of paper. Wasn't it? That's not how I got there. A little slip of paper and said, uh, read this book or something. I really don't recall how it happened. I, I don't know. I just, maybe I picked it up. Or, uh, I just don't know. Um, and was there a particular book? Uh, was it fiction, nonfiction that was more telling to you, maybe which one did you end up reading the, the most times? Oh, of Rand's books? Yes. Yeah. Atlas, mm -hmm. for sure. I also, after a while, was a fan of Milton Friedman, you know, uh, you read all of his, his stuff and, and got a Hayek and Mises and all that, but it all, it all started with Rand. Well, this is one of the reasons we exist so that we can uh, bring more Howie Riches into, into the world. <laughs> um, okay, Scott Schiff has a question on Zoom. He's asking, is there any risk uh, that others could agree with your idea for an Article 5 convention, but then grant it a much wider scope for potential constitutional changes? As we say in the business, that's a very good question, okay? And when we go to a state legislature, there are objections to this Article 5 route, even though we're limited to, we say we're limited, the convention would be limited to term limits on Congress. One of the objections is, and some of the, sometimes it's hidden, is, oh, I'm a state legislator and our legislature isn't term limited. So when I look disingenuous, if I vote for this Article 5 convention poll, and we have polling that shows the big enchilada is Congress. And again, it always starts with eight, like 80%. If you knew your uh, state legislator uh, was not term limited, but he favored term limits in Congress, be more or less likely to vote for him, very, very high. But the other objection, which I think you've alluded to, is wait a second, this convention, it's dangerous. It could run away. We're going to have pro life, pro choice. Nobody will have a gun. Everybody will have a gun. The sky is falling. It's a constitutional convention. Boy, it's scary. Well, <laughs> that's the main objection. And we think it is extremely weak. If, if anybody thinks about it, we think it's very weak. But they have to think about it. Some people don't think, okay? And <laughs> so it goes like this. In, under Article 5, if you read it, look at the Constitution. It is nowhere does it say constitutional prevention. It's called a convention for proposing amendments. And every one of our convention calls is limited to term limits on the US House of Representatives and the US Senate. That's it. And then there's a court system. Well, that's one control. I mean, if every convention call is limited to that and they wanna throw in something extraneous, you would think the courts would strike it down. But I could be wrong on that one. Because I've been wrong before. I think they would strike it down. But I could be wrong. Some states have what are called faithful delegate laws. So if a delegate from the state of Kansas 
goes to the convention and he, she wants to put something else in, they can recall, they can have civil penalties, they have criminal penalties. Okay, it's another little protection. Here's another minor one. Whatever comes out of a convention has to be ratified by three quarters of the states. So 38 states have to ratify it. Good luck with pro-choice in Utah, okay? Good luck with pro-life in Vermont, okay? You can't get to 38 states. So that's another protection. But the ultimate protection is something I alluded to a little bit earlier, which is there will never be a convention because of politics, because there will be great fear in Congress that state legislators who are delegates to the convention will make it retroactive and they'll be out of office. So what Congress will do in the end game, we think, is report out an amend a term limits amendment and they will grandfather themselves in. And there's precedent for this because the 22nd amendment, when Harry Truman was the president, he was grandfathered in, he could have kept running. But once he left two four year terms and you're out of here. All right, Instagram is starting to bubble for us. Uh, we got a question here from Isaiah on Instagram. Do you think the upcoming midterms will see more Republicans elected, especially Republicans that might be more sympathetic to term limits um, after the 2020 election? At this point, you never know in politics, it looks like the Republican year. It has to do with Biden. Biden's favorability is low, it's dropped recently. He's hurting on Afghanistan, uh, COVID-19 crisis, inflation, all kinds of stuff. And that translates. It's also a history, you know, when uh, for president first gets elected in the midterms, the other party usually does, what, does well. A lot of Republicans are talking about really big year. I don't know, but at this point, it looks really good for Republicans. If you, if you scratch your Republican running, most of them sign our pledge, by the way, the congressional pledge. Uh, you scratch them and ask them privately that they really like term limits. It's, it depends on the Republican. I wouldn't bet my life on it, but. They are signing the pledge. They do get on the bill. We hold their feet to the fire. And I think we're going to get more and more. But we are also, we, we play in Democratic primaries, okay? We, uh, we're, we're, we're looking to play on in one. We're nonpartisan. There's a Democratic primary in Texas 28. We just got involved in this recently. And um, the incumbent is a moderate Democrat, Henry Quaylor. And the challenger, this is a rerun of 2000 where the incumbent won by just a couple of points. The challenger, Jessica Cisneros, has been endorsed by AOC. So we did a poll in the district about three weeks ago, only amongst Democrats, because it's Democratic primary. And the numbers came <laughs> This is the startling numbers in the Democratic primary. Your favorite term limits on Congress, 84 to 11. Consequently, the AOC supported Democrat, Jessica Signeros, signed the term limits pledge. We got to her and she signed it. We're putting pressure now on Henry Quaylar to sign the pledge. I don't know if he will or won't, but if, if you ask me to bet on it, I think he will. So, <laughs> Um, we'll, we'll go anywhere and everywhere to play. Yeah, well, uh, it, it should be a bipartisan issue. Um, another question on Instagram, Manny Nguyen asks, thoughts on limiting how often Congress can assemble? Fewer days or maybe even once or twice every 
couple of years. Government has gone, gotten so large that it has so many tentacles. It's very difficult to go there. It's just Congress. I could see some legislatures like the Texas legislature meets every other year. Many, many legislatures are part-time, but Congress it would just be very difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. Olivia if G. Small, if, I, if we had smaller government, I'd be a strong advocate of that. Yeah. Uh, Olivia Jean Mary on Facebook uh, asks, any other major libertarian policies you support aside from term limits? The answer is all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but my focus, I like, if it's not 100%, it's 99.98% is on term limits. It's, it's, a, it's a rifle, not a shotgun. And by the way, back to the idea of bipartisan, we think it's very important because remember our market, our state legislators, it's very important not to take positions on other issues. Here I'm talking about the term limits movement or US term limits, the group I'm associated with. And so we go right down the middle. We don't talk about taxes, regulations, spending, any of that. We talk about two things, term limits, as you can imagine, and corruption. There are corruption stories all the time, usually associated with long time, being in office, in office for a long time. And so we point out corruption and term limits, because the truth is we need Democrats in some of these legislators, in some of these legislatures, and so that's what we do. Straight, straight down the middle. My personal views are, as you can imagine, hardcore libertarian. And speaking of uh, hardcore libertarian, opinions on the modern libertarian party, do you see it as an effective agent for change or does it simply siphon off votes for viable candidates who might realistically enact policies like term limits? Well, first of all, I have a long checkered past because I was involved in the Libertarian Party in the 80s. I was involved as, uh, uh, I ran uh, uh, the ballot drives in 1980 to eight for president. And, uh, very, very involved, I was involved in conventions. I ran four campaigns at conventions. In fact, I ran the floor campaign at Clark in 1979. In those days, we had conventions in odd number of years. Today, the LP, I think it has a place. Again, it's winner take all. The third parties are an extreme disadvantage. But I think it has a place. And I don't think it really, it, there's an argument to say, well, maybe it takes votes away from Republicans. But I don't think it really does. I mean, they've been, because they're a left, they're, there are left-wing issues, libertarian left-wing issues on Fourth Amendment. And, uh, so uh, I don't think it does. In fact, there was an election several years ago where analysis was done afterwards. I think it was a Virginia election. And I can't recall the, the name of the, um, the, the, the LP candidate who ran. And afterwards, there was an analysis. And it didn't seem to, he took votes from the Democrat and from the Republican both. So I, I don't think it, it, it hurts. And I think it's a good thing that the party is around. Question from Bruce Majors asking, what opportunities do you think the libertarian movement may have missed since the 1980s? Which opportunities do you believe it should make use of in the future? Term limits, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you stole my thunder. <laughs> They should. As a matter of fact, um, the libertarian presidential candidates have always been for term limits, uh, at least the last few of them. Um, but again, it doesn't resonate unless they get on the debate, the national debates. It doesn't uh, you know, resonate. But they've signed, we have a president, we have pledges to everybody. Okay? <laughs> we have a pledge for presidential candidates. So. 
and they all signed the presidential uh, uh, pledge. I don't, uh, I, I, I'm not a big advocate these days of the LP. Uh, I think I'm glad it's there, but again, one trick pony, and I'm not, it, it's not something that at this point that I'm really interested in. All right, well, in that case, we are getting a bunch of questions about the LP, so we're not going to, to go too much down that. Uh, that. Yeah. But, um, you know, I would uh, love to just hear about how you, you gave us a little bit about your ideological start, but uh, talk a, a little bit also about how you got your start in business and um, how you got into real estate development and, and maybe even bringing us up to the past couple of years, uh, whether your businesses were affected by these things like these rent moratoriums um, and, and how the economic climate is uh, affecting. It looks like more people are with inflation looking to, to real estate investments as a possible store of value. Yeah. Um, I'm in multifamily real estate these days and we did very poorly in the Great Recession. And I made a prediction when the first COVID thing hit and it was an eviction, it was an eviction ban, which I think was like, it's a taking, it's the most horrible thing I could ever imagine, particularly if you're in real estate. I made a prediction. I said 30% of our tenants wouldn't be paying rent, which would pretty much put us out of business. And fortunately, like many of my other predictions, this one was completely incorrect, okay? We had you know, some people who were behind in their rent and didn't pay rent, but it, it worked out fine. Um, so my background really has been real estate. When I put two nickels together way back when, I started out buying real estate in Manhattan. Uh, at that time, the sellers were mom and pop sellers and, and, and I wasn't even that sophisticated at that time in, in real estate. And um, I got lucky or whatever areas I started buying in, uh, got better. And, and so it worked. And then there's a section that under IRS section 1031 where you can trade like-kind exchanges, section 1031. I utilized that section. I got out of Manhattan and started buying elsewhere. And right now, real estate, at least multifamily real estate, is doing very, very well. I think inflation, Jennifer, does help real estate. It does. Uh, but we've done so well in recent years. I don't know how you could do much better with inflation. And you know, rents have gone up. One thing to worry about, I think. Um, at least on the margin, uh, is, I don't, I don't want to be Dr. Doom here, is rent control, which of course is a horrible uh, policy. Um, and there's been little murm noise here or there because rents have gone up. Mm -hmm. There's less building and markets work. And so there's clamoring for, uh, in some places, California, Oregon, for rent control. I mean, our, Oregon is, is a joke. I mean, they, they've got these like laws that, uh, I don't have any real estate in Oregon, by the way, but they have these laws that, uh, you know, restricted, they're, they're worried about uh, <clears throat> there's gonna be urban sprawl or whatever. And so they got these laws and it's extremely difficult to build. So as a result, there were fewer units and great demand. So what happened? Rents went up. So what did they do? They impose rent control. Okay, it's like such such a stupid, stupid, stupid uh, concept. But there's and there's concern about that. This could happen elsewhere, and it's, it's something that could happen down the line. But right now, uh, the real estate business, at least multifamily, is doing very well. Well. Um... We are coming up at the top of the hour. Our time has absolutely flown by. I want to apologize to the people that are now, of course, as we wrap up, getting flooded 
with, uh, with questions, but we got to quite a few of them. And I promised to let uh, Howie get back to his uh, new bride. So Mazel Tov, by the way, on, Thank you. on that. Uh, any final thoughts, Howie? Final thoughts, yes. You know, you have elections and we're going to elect so-and-so to the U.S. Senate or the other guy or woman. Well, we get six years out of that or maybe it goes on, but it's for now. Term limits is a little different because if you can amend the Constitution and impose term limits on politicians, it's for the generations. It's for posterity. And that's why we're in it. This one is for the generations. And I say no more. All right. Well, on that note, Howie, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for the work that you've done on so many issues, but uh, particularly uh, being just an atlas. Please don't shrug when it comes to term limits. It, it, it will happen and it will be because of you. So well, thank, thank you for you. having me on. Uh, and I want to thank all of you who have joined us uh, today. Um, thanks for your terrific questions. Uh, if you are enjoying these webinars, if you are enjoying our animated videos, our graphic novels, our student programs, our social media, please, we've got a couple more days, consider making a tax deductible donation to the Atlas Society. We very much appreciate it. And um, join me tomorrow on Clubhouse uh, and join me uh, also next week. I'm gonna be talking with Kara Dansky. She's the author of The Abolition of Sex for something completely different. We're gonna be talking about uh, the transgender agenda and um, the downsides for uh, particularly women and, um, and the gay community. So join us then. Thank you, Howie. Have a wonderful evening and have a happy new year.